Hello again. Today I'm going to talk about what to expect in the third movement of a four movement work. Um, and before I do that, though, let's uh, let's look at this handout that I sent to you all via email. Um, and hopefully, if you've been sort of keeping this next to you as you've been reading the book, listening to the tracks or watching the lecture, some of this is starting to make sense now. So I'm just going through each of these different uh, things that are listed after these Roman numerals. So that Roman numeral one refers to the first movement of a multi-movement work in the classical era, which tends to be in sonata form and have a fast tempo. Uh, second movement tends to be slow. Notice there's much less under uh, Roman numeral two because there's much less we could say generally about second movements other than they are slow, usually marked adagio or andante, uh, they are lyrical and song-like, that is, there's an emphasis on beautiful melody. And uh, that second movement will be in one of a variety of different forms. There is no one particular form which is expected uh, or customary. We happened to listen to a Haydn uh, second movement last lecture, which uh, just happened to be in theme and variation form, but that's not the only possibility by any means. All right, now, when we get to the third movement of a four-movement work, remember, this is the movement that would be omitted if we were talking about a three-movement work, such as a concerto or a typical sonata by, let's say, Haydn or Mozart. Now, some of those Beethoven sonatas do have all four movements of a, you know, like the, the four-movement work format, but uh, a piece with the title sonata by Haydn and Mozart or a concerto, by any composer of the classical era, tends to have only three movements, and it's the third out of four which is left out. That's the movement that I'm going to talk about today, the dance-like movement. And it's here under Roman numeral three on your handout. Now, on the handout, and I'm just going to stick it up to the camera for a second, um, under Roman numeral three there, you can see First of all, the title of this work is usually, that is the third movement, is usually Minuet and Trio. The Minuet was the most popular dance of the 18th century. And remember, this is the dance-like movement of the symphony, so it makes sense that it would be modeled on what was then the most popular dance. The Trio section is simply the middle section of the third movement. So the form of it, it's we hear this Minuet, we hear a contrasting section called the trio, and then we hear a repeat of the minuet, and that gives us ABA form, also known as ternary form. Ternary simply means having three sections, and those three are, we could, we could sort of diagram them ABA, because the, the last section is simply a repeat of the first section. And that way we get some variety, because we have two different sections, but we also have some continuity. Uh, because the A section repeats. Now notice, though, I've got some lowercase numerals in there as well. So this is sort of like the mid-level or maybe micro-level form. There's also an ABA going on within the A section, and a CBC going on within the B section. Now actually, that form, CBC, I'm sorry, CDC, I'm looking at it backwards here in my camera screen. It's really the same form as ABA. I'm just using different letters because it's different material, but the idea is the same. Within the trio, we have some stuff. We have a, maybe just a couple of phrases of a melody. We could call it C, little letter C, lowercase, because it's not a major section. Uh, and then we hear something different. We could call it D. We don't want to call either one of these A or B because we've already heard the uh, A and B subsections over here in the uh, in the minuet within the larger A section, right? Remember what I talked about? These, these forms exist on different levels and there's sort of nested structures going on. Um, now, the other thing I want to call your attention to here are the dots. When you have dots on the either end of something in music, it's a repeat sign. So, so, for example, within the minuet, right, big letter A, that little 
lowercase letter a, that, that little a section repeats. It is played twice. Then we go on to the b, lowercase b, followed by a. That whole section is repeated also. When we get into the trio, same deal. We have a phrase, we could call it C. It is heard twice. Then we move into the D contrasting phrase or section, subsection, followed by a reprise of C. That whole section is repeated. So we have some internal repeats going on. When we come back at the end here and hear the the return of the minuet, that is big letter A, Notice those dots are missing. We don't need to repeat that material anymore because we've already heard it. We've heard it twice back here, right? So the return of the minuet is identical except that we don't take those additional little repeats of the subsections. Okay, this will make sense hopefully if you just kind of follow the sheet as we're listening. I'll point out these repeats because we're going to listen to in a moment, we're going to listen to the uh, third movement of a very well-known work by Mozart, which is in this exact form. So, um, I want to also point out a couple other things. Another thing that it says on this handout, something that we'll get to a little bit later when we talk about Beethoven, it says here, third movement, minuet and trio. That's the title given, and remember it refers to a specific type of dance. It says in parentheses, or scherzo in trio, in some Beethoven. Now, I, I know you look at that word, S-C-H-E-R-Z-O, and it looks like scherzo or something, but it's a hard C-H, because it's Italian. Scherzo. Scherzo is simply <clears throat> the Italian word for a joke. Um, we sometimes see the word also in music, scherzando, jokingly. Um, so, in some Beethoven multi-movement works, instead of the title Minuet and Trio, for this third out of four movements, we sometimes see the title Scherzo and Trio. What's the difference? Well, um, the Scherzo implies a faster tempo and a sort of a joking character, right? A more humorous, lighthearted kind of character. And it has to do with the fact that by the time we get into the, the, the life and career of Beethoven, who, remember, is the youngest of our three great classical composers. There's Haydn, who's the oldest by quite a bit. Haydn born in 1732, then Mozart born 1756, and then Beethoven born in 1770. Well, certainly during the lifetime of Haydn and later Mozart, uh, whose lifetime was unfortunately uh, tragically short. Uh, Mozart died the earliest by quite a bit uh, of any of these three. Mozart died only 35 years old. Um, by the time we get to Beethoven, however, the minuet is no longer the most popular dance in Europe. Right? During the lifetime of Haydn and Mozart, it was. But when we get into the 19th century, another dance comes along, the waltz and becomes the sensation, uh, the, the minuet is kind of considered old-fashioned as we move into the 1800s, as we move into the 19th century. And I think this is, probably has something to do with why Beethoven no longer has minuets. It would just sound a little bit old-fashioned. So instead, he keeps the same form, that ABA form, ternary form, and uh, he keeps the same uh, dance-like character for the most part, but he substitutes the title scherzo and trio instead of minuet and trio. Um, okay, uh, the third movement is also, it tends to be the shortest of the four movements of a four movement work. We're actually going to listen to two different examples of, uh, of third movements, of minuets, uh, both by Mozart. And they are both rather short compared to the other movements in these in each of the, the works that they are embedded within. Um, so the first one, this is, and by the way, I'm, I'm basically just tracking what's in the book. Again, if you have Hamian, Ninth Brief Edition, 
Uh, all of this information is found on page 172, uh, going over to 173. On 173 is the listening guide for the piece that we're about to listen to now. So you might want to uh, take out your book or um, maybe open another window on your computer if, you're, if you have the online book. And they talk here about the minuet and trio. Now, um, uh, one other thing I'll mention. So the, the minuet that we're about to hear is the third movement of a piece by Mozart, which he gave the title Eine kleine Nachmusik, which simply means a little night music. And this is not, it's not a symphony. It's a piece for a chamber ensemble. It's a serenade. A serenade is a genre of chamber music. Now remember, we've already talked about chamber music actually beginning in the Baroque era, but chamber music is simply music for a small group. Uh, and it is usually played in a smaller room, in a chamber rather than a big concert hall. And um, this it just so happens that this is one of uh, Mozart's best-known works. You probably won't recognize the minuet and trio, but if we had played the first movement of Eine Kleine Nacht music instead, you would definitely recognize it because it's this thing that goes like this. Uh... <laughs> Mozart's best-known works kind of I'm sure Mozart would be probably kind of puzzled if he could be you know teleported 230 whatever odd years into the future and and uh, be told that this was one of his best-known works because these kind of serenades are the kind of thing that Mozart would write um, actually usually sort of um, uh, on commission for certain special occasions, like parties. It's sort of like background music for a party, basically. It's not something that Mozart probably spent a whole lot of time on or considered like one of his very serious, important works. It's just something that he did kind of as a side job, probably. But for whatever reason, probably just because Mozart's a genius and uh, you know he just had a gift for writing things that are catchy and lovable, uh, Eine Kleine Nacht music has gone on to be uh, one of his best known works. So that was, what I just played there is the first theme of the first movement of the serenade by Mozart that he gave the title A Little Night Music. What we're going to hear now is the third movement, but this actually brings up a good point. Remember, if we're talking about a four movement work, it doesn't really matter so much what the genre is. By genre, I mean symphony or a serenade or a string quartet, or let's say a, a Beethoven piano sonata. Some of the Beethoven piano sonatas have four movements. Again, Mozart and Haydn sonatas usually don't, but about half of the Beethoven sonatas have four movements. And in that case, even though the genre is different, talk about a piece for orchestra versus a small chamber ensemble versus solo piano, the genre is different, but the structure, the basic structure is the same. The mood might be very different. Uh, if we're talking about a serenade, it's going to be a, you know, a light, pleasant, entertaining kind of mood. If we're talking about a symphony, it might have a very different mood. But the form is still the same, or essentially the same. There might be slight little differences like, um, from one composition to another, but the basic structure is going to be the same. Okay, so let's listen to... The third movement of Eine Kleine Nachtmusik. Uh, I'm going to hit play on the CD player here and I'm going to talk over it and point out how this form is working. So, um, obviously, the first thing we're going to hear is the minuet itself, the A section, and the first little subsection, which I've given the, the uh, designation lowercase a, and that little section is going to be repeated. All right, and then we'll move on to the B and repeat of little a. Okay, here we go. This is Eine Kleine Nacht Musik, third movement. Notice it's in triple meter. The minuet is always in triple meter. Back to the beginning. Repeating the little lowercase a. One, two, three, one, two, three. 
this is little b. Notice it's different. But then little a comes back. Go back, repeat little b. And then the return of little a. Now, the trio. This is phrase C, subsection C. Notice the mood is very different. It's not so heavy. It's not like the beat is being... Here it repeats. It's very light and airy. Orchestration is much more uh, lighthearted. Gets a little bit heavier. Now this is D, but then C comes back. Coming to the end of the return of C, and now we'll go back to letter D. C. Now we're coming to the end of the trio. The minuet is going to repeat, but we're not going to repeat those little subsections. So this is subsection A, lowercase a. We're coming to the end of it, but we move right on to subsection B, lowercase b, and subsection A to end the thing. Okay, now, uh, if I were doing this in the normal way in our classroom with the blackboard, I would have the structure uh, up there on the blackboard, I'd be underlining these different sections as they happen. Uh, you might need to listen to it more than once, but if you just listen and follow along with what I said, you know, you'll be able to tell this structure. So we have, an, we have overall an ABA structure that's minuet, trio, and return of the minuet. But then within each of those, uh, we have these little substructures, which are actually pretty short. Uh, they go by in maybe, you know, half a, half a minute or less, right? So that overall, that entire movement was only, what, three or four minutes long, right? Okay, uh, let's listen to another example by Mozart, and this will, this will make the, uh, the case of what I just said earlier. This is in the same form. The only difference, actually, is that in this particular third movement. Now this is the third movement of the symphony number 40, um, which is a piece that we listened to at the beginning of this unit. Remember this? Um, right? uh, that was the first movement of the symphony number 40. We're going to hear the third movement. The only difference in the structure of this third movement is there's a coda. Remember what a coda is? It's a concluding section. There is a coda at the end of the minuet. Uh, and because it's at the end of the minuet, we get to hear that coda more than once, actually. We hear it at the end of the minuet uh, the first time it appears, but then we also hear it at the end of the minuet when it repeats. Right? Other than that, the structure is exactly the same, but the mood is very different because this is, for one thing, this is a symphony, which means it's, it's bigger, it, we have more instruments, there's just going to be greater volume of sound, and it's also kind of implied that it's a more serious kind of piece uh, than a little serenade, which is a kind of a lighter, a piece that's meant just for light entertainment rather than kind of a bigger serious work like a symphony. Other big difference is Eine kleine Nachtmusik is in a major key, whereas the Symphony Number no. 40 by Mozart is in a minor key, and it's, it's it kind of has this... Uh, this feeling of gloom about it. Uh, so, let's listen to, and I'll point out the structure is exactly the same, except for the addition of the coda. Um, this is one that doesn't have a listening guide in your book, but uh, this is the third movement of the Symphony Number no. 40 in G minor by Mozart, and it's a minuet, and it's in ternary form, and it goes like this. <laughs> This is little letter A. Notice it's a 
about the same tempo, and it, again, it's in triple meter. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Repeating little letter A now. Coming to the end of the second time through, little letter A, and now little letter B, lowercase b. Notice there's a little bit of polyphonic texture going on because we've got the main melody in the lower strings and a little counter melody in the upper strings. Return of little letter A, we're coming towards the end of the minuet. the orchestration changes the coda. It's winds instead of strings. Okay, now we're going to go back and repeat lowercase b. Again, we have a little bit of polyphonic texture going on. And return of lowercase a. We're going to come up to the coda once again. There it is. We can hear the melody in the flute, bass line with the bassoons, and now the trio. Notice how the mood is different in the trio. It's lighter, it's airier, it's... We have a nice variety of orchestration. We're hearing each of the different wind instruments in tune, in turn. And then the strings come back. Strings and winds. So now we're repeating the C section, lowercase c. Oboe. Flute. Bassoon. Each taking a turn with a phrase. Violins. Now we have lowercase d. Lower strings and winds kind of playing off each other. French horns. French horns again. Coming to the end of the trio, but we're going to repeat, going back to letter D, lowercase d. Return of C, lowercase c. French horns again. Coming to the end of the trio, which means the minuet comes back. And here we have that heavy feeling again that characterizes the minuet. So we're in the A section of the minuet, lowercase a. We're not going to repeat this time. We're going to go right on to the B section of the minuet, lowercase b. the polyphonic section. And lowercase a, coming back. And all that's left is, we're going to hear the coda, the concluding section. There it is. That's it. Oops, and that's the next movement. That's the last movement of that particular symphony, and even just that little bit of it that you heard, fast tempo, right? So next time we're going to talk about the 
final movement of a multi-movement instrumental work in the classical era. And whether we're talking about a four-movement work, like a symphony or a piece of chamber music, or maybe a Beethoven piano sonata, or if we're talking about a three-movement work, like a concerto or a Mozart or Haydn piano sonata, that final movement is going to be fast in tempo. Right? You heard just a little snippet of the last movement of the Mozart symphony there, and it was fast. So, final movements tend to be fast, and they will either be in, usually, rondo form or sonata form. Uh, either, either of those is possible. Now, we've already talked about sonata form. Talked about sonata form quite a bit, like two lectures ago, because first movements tend to be in sonata form. Sonata form has the, those three main sections, exposition, development, recapitulation. There's a first theme and a second theme, and all that stuff I've already talked about. So I'm not going to talk about uh, sonata form again. I am going to talk about rondo form next time, because rondo form is the other possibility for last movements. But by the way, uh, on the subject of rondo form, rondo form can also be found in the second movement of a multi-movement work, right? Remember, second movements, there is no one particular form which is standard or expected or correct. So that's another place where we might find rondo form in the slow movement of a multi-movement work. So we might find that form in the slow movement, or we might find it in the fast final movement. And again, the tempo is a separate issue from the form. A piece could be in rondo form, or sonata form, or whatever form, and how fast or how slow it is, the tempo, is a completely different issue that really doesn't have anything to do with it. Okay, so next lecture, we'll talk about the finale, that is the last movement of a multi-movement work, and we'll talk about rondo form. So, see you then.